Just to kind of pick up where we left off last week, we were talking about uh, uh, Pamphylia and Galatia. So um, a lot of times you see the book of Galatians, but it's not a single church. It is multiple churches. I think she needs another. Brother Amos, you. There we go. Um, it's not one church that the, the book was written to. It was multiple churches that we saw last week. But uh, there in Pamphylia, the small, one of the smallest little uh, uh, areas or uh, regions in the Roman Empire. And uh, um, within that, Paul and Barnabas, when they left Cyprus, they headed to, uh, uh, to Pamphylia and went to a city called Perga. And, of course, uh, Perga Pamphylia is what it was mentioned to, but it was the first city in Asia Minor visited by Paul and Barnabas. Now, of course, it would not be the last, but it was the, uh, it was the first one. And still some of the ruins to this day, and if you were able to go to these, uh, this place over in, in uh, southwest, southeastern Turkey is where the modern country is, you could walk on the exact same roads that uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, walked on. And later, Paul and Silas, um, and probably Timothy and Luke and all those, uh, probably walked through this area because it was a major port city that was an entrance into, uh, uh, into that area. But you can see the ruins, and we looked at that last week, still there to this day, that same exact road um, as they, they moved through and... Uh, some of the same type of styles. And again, it's very common to see this style of architecture. Remember the Roman architecture with the arches that are rounded uh, in the 1100s, 1200s. That changes to Gothic and they're, they're more pointed. But these are the Roman architecture that you'll see a lot of uh, things uh, common in those, those times. This is the city when they reach that, that land um, John Mark leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. And uh, again, it's a great thing we can see that because John Mark later on comes back and Paul says he's profitable to me in the ministry. And we pointed out the fact that um, God still uses us no matter when we start or stop. And uh, God's a, a God of second chances, third, fourth, fifth chances. And his grace uh, is, is, is merciful and I was preaching on that last uh, Sunday night as well. And so then this is the, the uh, they go from there to Antioch of Pisidia that we've already talked about. And they go to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. And that's what we're going to talk about today in that area of Galatia. Galatia is the area. So when the Bible mentions of this region, uh, it mentions several churches in that area. And that's what we're going to see today. Uh, strong imperial worship. We talked about this last week. They worshiped the emperor, thinking that the emperor was the um, uh, direct descendant of Zeus uh, or Jupiter. As the, Zeus was the Greek uh, name for the god, and uh, Jupiter was the same demon that they worshiped. It's all demonic uh, demon worship. Uh, you'll have that same exact thing in, in countries. Uh, you know, in Haiti, I saw this, and in other, I've talked to other missionaries in other countries, and they they talk about worshiping these demons, and they give them names. Uh, in in fact, uh, in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds, or excuse me, uh, late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds in Haiti, when the French, it was a French colony, and they imported slaves from Western Africa to uh, work the sugarcane fields there in on the island of Hispaniola. Um, the, uh, the slaves brought their spirit worship over from Western Africa. But because the French were a, was a Catholic nation, they outlawed it. They said, we're going to make a law against this, and you can't do this. You have to worship in the Catholic religion, and you can't worship the demons. You can't worship those spirits. You just put that away. So they made a law against it. Well, just like you can't you know, regulate a lot of things by laws. People are still going to do illegal activities. They actually gave those demons names of the saints in the Catholic Church. And to this day, those demons still have, they use those names of those saints in the Catholic Church 
to refer to those demons that they worship. But it's the same exact demons that most likely they were worshiping here uh, in, in the Roman Empire. Uh, the same, same demons that, that control people and do certain things. And uh, so you would have St. Bartholomew, St. Joseph, you know, and uh, uh, that even at the witch doctor. I've been to the homes of witch doctors and gone to their gates. They, they usually won't let you in the, the gate, although one did. Uh, his name was Bono. And uh, he, he, uh, we walked right up and was talking to one, uh, one of his wives. And uh, uh, he came out thinking that we wanted him to do something for us, you know. And we started giving the gospel, and he turned around and walked off. And, and uh, he didn't ask us to leave or anything. He just, he just wouldn't talk to us anymore. And so, uh, but on the, uh, the gate, you know, wooden gate or whatever going into their yard, a lot of times there will be a cross. They'll have a cross. It'll be like a Greek Orthodox cross. It'll have double crosses sometimes. Sometimes it'll be upside down cross. But always there's going to be some type of religious uh, symbol that they use. And at the voodoo services, they'll start out by singing hymns, believe it or not. They'll be singing church hymns. And then they'll change the service over and the drums and everything. You can tell the, the rhythm of the drum beats gets different. And it, sometimes it's a more aggressive beat to it. And um, those are the times when, they're, when they're, uh, the Haitians say they're, they're pushing for possession when they, when they get into that aggressive drum beat. And so, um, And here's the amazing thing about it. In the charismatic churches, you hear that exact same drum beat in the charismatic churches as you do in the voodoo services. And there have been a lot of cases where they invite the witch doctor in to lead the singing in the church service. And so those are, uh, they call them uh, uh, l'église mélange, which means... Uh, uh, mixing churches where they mix the religions together and they mix those together and they uh, they do these weird things that go on you know and stuff like that so uh, and then people end up getting possessed and then you have problems in your church you got to deal with and you have uh, people that uh, that you have to deal with a lot of those problems but anyway but the fact is it's demonic worship you know uh, with with voodoo and and a lot of those spirit religions in Madagascar, they, they worship the bones. They actually have the bones of their ancestors, and they, they pray around those. Uh, the Native American Indians with the spirits and everything, it's all spirit worship. There is an element to those types of religions that I would say maybe 4 to 5% is superstition. But the rest of it is demonically charged Satan worship. It, that's all it is, plain and simple. And so it was the same exact thing that they had back in this time, and it's the same thing. We have that here in America, but they don't always call it voodoo. Have you ever seen a store where it says drinks and spirits? Yeah, because they're deadening themselves, their brain. That's why we don't, the Bible says don't be drunk with wine. We're in excess, be filled with the Spirit. Because they're deadening their mind with that alcohol and that opens them up to demonic forces and demonic uh, oppression and possession, that same thing. Um, so you have a lot of that that goes on here in America um, and it's labeled differently and, you know, that kind of thing and, and people, when you, when you talk about this, you notice I don't really talk about it too much, you know. But when you talk about this, people kind of look at you like you got two heads and things like that. And in fact, I've, I've talked to, to pastors today that they say it's impossible for someone to be possessed by a demon in today. Because they were only possessed when Jesus was on the earth. Well, they're someone that doesn't understand that Satan works around all the, I mean, he, I mean, he didn't stop working just because Jesus is on the earth, you know what I'm saying? So he, people were possessed before Jesus is on the earth, and they're possessed after. So, um, so anyway, uh, but you have that here in America. People are 
are filled with all kind of influences. And that's all it is, is there's it's some other way to get away from serving the Lord. This morning, people were filled. Now, I'm not saying they're all possessed or anything, but I will say they were all filled with the spirit of greed, envy, whatever else at the barnyard this morning because they were there and not in church. Now, I'm not saying all those people were demon-possessed. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is Satan will put that thought and put that spirit of doing something other than being at church. You see what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about. They're worshiping idols in the fact that they put something else important in, uh, to them that's important other than God, something in place of God. And that's what they come to. And that's what these people did in Galatia. They were strong in imperial worship, worshiping the emperor um, for that. So, so, so these are some of the temples they had built to the different emperors. And, of course, uh, the letter of the, the, the book of Galatians was an epistle that was written, the Bible says, to the churches in Galatia. Notice it says, uh, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So it's not one church in Galatia. Uh, early in the ministry, I, I used to say Paul wrote this letter to the church there in Galatia, but it was not. It was churches, plural, uh, that he'd written to. And uh, um, he was most likely writing that from Antioch and Syria, from the, where he went back into the, uh, most likely on his first furlough. Remember we talked about the missionaries' furlough? Um, Paul and Barnabas, they came back, Acts chapter 14. They came back and they rehearsed all the things that God had done to the church there at Antioch. So in other words, they, they gave a, a report, a missionary report. And while he was there, probably he had heard report people had visited him there in Antioch before he started his second missionary journey. And uh, he wrote the epistle and said, these are some things that you're doing wrong you need to correct. And, uh, um, and it was a very forceful letter, in fact. So, so that region. All right, then we have Iconium. And we talked about Iconium, the first stop there. Oh, there we go. Iconium, and that's the first stop. Then he goes to Lystra and Derby. So founding of the church we have there in Acts chapter 14, verse 1, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and, to, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. So this is the actual founding of the church. Isn't that exciting? When you have these group of people. I remember... Uh, the actual founding of the two churches we had there in Haiti. We had worked and worked and, and visited and, and uh, gave the gospel and had went into the little market areas and just had uh, open-air meetings and uh, had this Haitian guy that I'd gotten an accordion for and he was playing the accordion and everybody came over just to hear and we were passing out gospel tracts and preaching and some people got saved and, and, uh, um, and then uh, uh, we also had a lot of demonic forces against us because the witch doctor, uh, some of his, his wives came and tried to stop us. Uh, he didn't actually come over there, but uh, they came and tried to stop us from preaching. But um, uh, then I went up in those little areas, and I remember I got a little nucleus of people, and I found a man in that area that had, a, had uh, been saved um, through another missionary that had come through years and years and years ago. In fact, they, they were no longer alive. And he had gotten saved a long time ago, but it was, you know, there was no church for him to go to. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I said, can, can, we, uh, can we use your yard to start a church? And he said, oh, Pastor Harry, that would make me so happy. That would make me so happy. And so, uh, uh, for a moment, uh, I call him, to this day, I can go to that area and say, my uncle, that's my uncle, uh, Tonton, Tonton Monac is what I call him, uh, Frere Monac, is his, Brother Monac uh, is his name, but anyway, but we met in his yard, and we, I remember the very first Sunday morning service, and we had that little nucleus of people there, and it just kept growing and growing and growing, eventually we built a, a building um, but uh, 
But this is the founding of the church, and it's so exciting when you come across this because out of this comes many, many more churches. Many, many more churches. And so that's the founding of the church, Acts 14.1. Uh, it's an exciting thing that took place. And then they go back to encourage the Christians there in Iconium. And we talked a little bit about this, and that's the thing where we call discipleship. Now remember, the Bible changes in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transitional book. The book of Acts, they change from calling the 12 men that followed Jesus, stops calling them disciples, and transitions to call them the apostles and calls believers the disciples. Okay? And then in Acts chapter uh, uh, 12, it will change to call them, excuse me, Acts chapter 11, it will change to call them Christians. The first time is in Antioch. And so you have that transition to what we call people. So that's why today we call us Christians. But we're believers, we're disciples. Uh, can you have someone who is a believer but not a disciple? Yes, you can. They can get saved but never grow. Uh, Paul said, These newborn babes in Christ desire the sincere milk of the word. They can't eat meat. You ever heard something say, These are a baby Christians? And I've met people who have been saved for years and years and years and they're still baby Christians because they haven't grown. They still have the problems in their life. Let's face it, we all got problems, don't we? Last Sunday night I was preaching the sin that so easily besets us. Okay? If I were to stand up here and say I don't have any problems, the Lord would strike me dead because see, I know I've got problems. Everybody's got problems. But the fact of the matter is there are things in our life that we need to get over to grow. So being saved is not like a staircase, but the Christian life is like the staircase. You have to go up a step, up a step, up a step to get to that growing and, and to get to a, a closer relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in the Old Testament... You know, there's, uh, I don't know if it's in this hymn book. I don't know. I hadn't seen it. But I know in that the, the red hymn book and, and the Baptist hymnal, the Southern Baptist hymnal, and a couple other hymnals, I've seen the song in there, in there. But it talks about working for the salvation, you know, and doing things. Well, the fact of the matter is we can't do anything for salvation. And it relates, that song relates heaven to Canaan land. You ever heard, heard that song? Have you ever, about relating heaven to Canaan land? Heaven ain't Canaan land because there ain't no battles in heaven, thank the Lord. Canaan land is a, is a type, an example of the Christian life because we have battles all the time. And have you known someone in your life, a Christian I'm talking about, not an unsaved person, I'm talking about a Christian, where it's like they constantly have the same problem in their life and they, it's like they just can't quite get over that one thing. Now, I'm not talking about like, you know, sin that so easily besets us. But it's like they got that one struggle. They just can't get by it. They can't get by it. They can't get by it. And they're out of church because of this or they're, you know, it's just that one struggle it's because they have not grown and they, they haven't reached that point to where maybe they need to sacrifice something to give something up in order to get closer to the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, when I was assistant pastor years and years ago, you know, the, these people, they would come into church, you know, on Wednesday night and they'd say, pray for us Sunday morning. We're going to be at the flea market trying to sell our dogs. And that what was and I and I I'll be honest with you I never prayed for them to sell their dogs on Sunday morning at the flea market okay I never did the Lord knows my heart but I never once said Lord help them that on Sunday morning to go sell their dogs at the flea market because on Saturday they wouldn't go to the flea market they worked out around the yard and so they'd go to the flea market on Sunday to try to sell the dogs 
They, ne they never were able to sell dogs. I mean, they had problem after problem after problem. Dogs get sick, die, you know, this kind of thing. They would have problems with the AKC paperwork and all this stuff. And I'm thinking as a young 20-some-year-old in the ministry, I'm thinking, can you not see that the Lord's not going to bless your dog business if you're trying to work on Sunday? You know what I'm saying? And so... So there's things that go on in people's lives where that, that, that step you've got to take over. And that's where they were talking about the disciples, the people who are following Christ and wanting to get closer to the Lord. Okay, So that's kind of what they're looking at. So the founding of the church, they went back to encourage them. That's why in your Bible, if you look in the, second, the first missionary journey and the maps in the back, you'll see this like circle thing and the arrows going both ways. Because after they went and finished up in Derby. They went back and encouraged the Christians. You have to do that. Okay? Um, as a church planter in a foreign field, they, they are, and, and this is the way you have to look at it, and I, the Lord had to really help me with this when I first went to the field. They're not going to do everything like we do here in America. So you've got to just wipe that whole thing out of your mind. You know, we've got to get back to the Bible to see what the Bible says. And to get to where their Bible, see what their Bible says in there. Um, you know, because sometimes wording is a little bit different. And just because we, uh, oh, like for example, what do we do when we take an offering? Brother Bob and Brother Amen or whoever will come up here and get the plate and walk back to the back. And, you know, everybody will put their offering in and things like that. In Haiti, they don't do that. Brother Waters, you witness this. They leave the offering plates up front, and during a hymn, everybody walks up to the front and puts their offering in the offering plate. They don't sit in the pew. Everybody walks up to the front. That's when you have your fellowship time. That's when they put the, the money in the, in the offering plate and go up to the front. You know. And we had a rule. You couldn't make change in the offering plate because they would want to. They would want to make change in the offering plate. We said, no, you can't do that because they might not be good in math. <laughs> you know, they they make, make problems. You know, they'd want to have a hundred goods and say, I want to give 50 and, you know, they get confused and, you know, things like So our rule was you can't make change in the offering plate. If you want to make change, wait till after the service and, and we'll help you with that. But, but that's what they did. They brought it forward and put it in the offering plate. But, you know, you try that here in some churches here in America and, boy, they're like, well, that's sacrilegious, you know, that kind of thing. But you got to, so you got to wipe things out of your mind when you go to those... And so going back, and you have to encourage them and set some things straight, set some things right. You know, uh, um, you know. I remember going, and I, the first church, well, although the first church, the pastor, the national pastor that took it over, he came in and cleaned house. I mean, he did a lot of church discipline that I didn't know things were going on because I didn't understand the culture. So... You're going into a yard here and one of the members of the church that uh, are, you know, they're, they're singing in one of the groups, sing groups, you know. And uh, um, you go in the yard and you're like, oh, man, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? They got that little bottle hanging up to catch the sunlight. And they got these bottles kind of buried with the top of the bottle sticking up out of the dirt like that around. And oh, that's pretty neat. And oh, look at that. They've got a aloe plant growing over there. Yeah, all those things are voodoo. <laughs> I didn't know it. I didn't know. They used the aloe plant in voodoo. And uh, if, although it's a great medicinal, I have an aloe plant in my house. You have know, to get burned and stuff like that. But in Haiti, it's associated with voodoo. And, uh, uh, and you, they plant it on the corner of the houses so the, the, the demons can't get up on their house. That's the reason they do that, you know. And, uh, and then those bottles, they have uh, uh, fetishes in them that are buried around to keep the evil spirits out and all this kind of stuff, you know. And I had no idea. I mean, half my church was involved with voodoo, and I didn't even know it. So when he came in, buddy, he cleaned house, and he disciplined people and put them out of the singing groups and, and, uh, and, and called out their sin, and, and they repented. Had a lot of them repent. Had some that, that wouldn't, you know, and things like that. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you've got to go back and you have to teach. You have to do things. You have to set things right. That's one of the most difficult things a pastor has to do is pastor his people and correct things. And it's tough. It is tough. 
Uh, I had a guy, his wife um, got into a fight with somebody at the market. He was, uh, he was uh, one of the two men I had in my church, the second church. I only had two men in that church uh, at the beginning. And uh, uh, his wife got into a fight with somebody at the market and knocked over her table and tore up some stuff and she wouldn't pay for it. And so the, uh, uh, she went to the court and all this kind of stuff, magistrate or whatever, and they sent the justice of the peace out uh, to her house to tell her she had to pay so much money. And she, she took off after him with an ax and was trying to kill him, you know, and everything. Well, you just can't have that for people who are, you know, he was the, the music director and the, the uh, Sunday school teacher. And his wife, it, you just can't have that kind of stuff going on when people are trying to kill each other with axes. That's just not a good practice in your church members. So I went over there, you know, and I sat down with them and I talked and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, they sat there and, you know, they told me their story. Of course, didn't tell everything. And, uh, uh, and I sat there and I listened, you know, and everything. And they told everything. And I said, Sister Weeby, did you try to kill him with an axe? And boy, she just blew up at me and just got all mad and everything. I thought she was going to try to kill me with an axe, you know. And I just sat there in that chair and didn't move a muscle. And they were all, their hands were going like this and their mouth, you know, blah, 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 you know. And I couldn't catch well half of what they said. And I think they were using curse words because there were words I didn't understand because I don't know all the curse words in the Creole. But, uh, but anyway, and I told them, I said, I, and, I, and I finally, they finally calmed down after like 20 minutes of going and going and going and going. And I said, I just said calmly again, I said, you never answered my question. I said, did you try to kill him with an ax? And they just kind of looked at me. I said, that man is unsaved. I said, we have tried to witness to him and tried to get him in a church. I said, and you act like an unsaved person and go over there with an ax and try to kill him when I have tried to witness to him and tried to get him in the church. I said, how do you think that's going to make everybody feel here at the church and in the community? I said, don't you realize you have ruined the testimony of this church and you and your family? And then she started again, and I just said, stop. I said, you haven't listened to a word I've said. I said, and God is going to judge you, and if you don't repent, then God is going to just destroy your family. And so I just got up and walked out, and they, they, never did, they never did repent. They left the church, obviously. You know. And uh, later on, she had a problem with demons, and I went over to pray with her, and they wouldn't let me in the house, you know, things like that. So it was all kind of problems and everything. But you have to go and you have to correct. And that's one of the most difficult things of a pastor. And these men, as they went back, they had to correct and they had to write letters and say, you've got to change this. You've got to do differently. And so to go back and encourage the churches, and the Bible says they went and ordained elders, people that were older, that maybe were Jews and knew more of the Old Testament, in order to teach the people what they should be doing. And so they ordained elders. And last week we talked about the fact that the word elder here, you know, again, we try to, people try to Americanize the Bible and things like that and all. But, but elder is just talking about someone who is older, someone who is experienced. And, and again, you can have someone 70 years old that's been saved for 40 years but still a babe in Christ. You know what I'm saying? as opposed to someone who is, who is maybe 40 years old, who's been saved for 20 years, and is, is far advanced spiritually and understands the things of God and closer to the Lord than the other person. So you cannot go just by age necessarily. Although this term in the Greek is referring to older people, you know, and, and again, let's think back now, the life expectancy during the time of the Apostle Paul is like 60, 55, 60 years old. That's an old, ancient person. Okay? 
Today, the life expectancy in the United States is, I think, 72 me, two for men and 70, uh, is it 75 for women, I think, or 74 for women, or something like that, uh, in the United States. But, you know, think back uh, years and years ago, you know, when, when all this heart disease was coming out, you know, in the 50s, uh, you had people die of massive heart attacks all the time, and they didn't, they didn't live as long because the health care wasn't. Uh, it really wasn't until Dwight Eisenhower had his heart attack that they started to research and understand what caused those heart attacks and the cholesterol stuff came about, changing diets and all. Uh, came about. Both my grandfathers died uh, of massive heart attacks before I was even born, you know, so they were in their uh, uh, mid-50s is uh, when they died. But um, so, so they had to go back and they had to find people with a little bit of maturity to help lead the churches. And then in Lystra, we were talking about after they left Iconium, they were run out on the rail, on a rail, literally. They, they were leaving to escape persecution in Iconium because, and persecution from where? The Roman government? Nope, from the Jews. That's exactly right. The Jews didn't like the religion of Jesus and they ran, they caused all kinds of problems. The Bible says they gathered together lewd fellows of a baser sort and they caused all kind of insurrection and so they leave to go to Lystra and what happens? Now this is a possible birthplace of, of Timothy uh, and they, they go there. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, 1 through 4, Lystra Derby. It lists those two cities, uh, about eight miles apart, lists those two cities as where Timothy was from. So we don't know exactly, we don't know exactly uh, where he was born, but it lists those two cities in Acts chapter 16, verse 1 through 4. Um, we know his mother and grandmother. We know his, his father was an unsaved man. And while Timothy is a very important person in the New Testament, we never hear from Timothy, nor Titus. We never hear from them. And after the Apostle Paul dies, there's nothing ever written about him ever again. But they are very integral to the founding of the churches and the discipleship of the people. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, traditional things, but we're talking about in the scriptures. But Paul and Barnabas go to Lystra to flee persecution there in Iconium. That's when a crippled man was healed. Uh, he's sitting there and Paul says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Your faith has made you whole. And they preached the gospel and there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Now, it's interesting. This is the key right here because this is not a proof of faith healing. It says, The same heard Paul speak, who steadfast beholding him. Who is this, this preposition referring to? If you, if you, uh, uh, you, if you take and... Uh, a diagram this sentence. Okay, I know people don't like diagramming, but it's very important in the Bible to figure out who the pronouns refer to. But if you diagram this sentence, this direct object here, who, refers back to this predicate here, which is Paul. Who, or we could say Paul, steadfastly beholding him, referring back to the impotent man, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. He, referring back to the crippled man, faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet, then he left and walked. Now, the faith healer groups, the charismatic mess, will use this verse and say, this is the Apostle Paul saying, Paul had faith, and he said, you do that. No. In the Greek and in the English, if you diagram this sentence, you will see that the he having faith, him, beholding him, that he had faith, refers back to the impotent man. The same thing in the book of James. It says, those that have faith call for the elders of the church and anoint, ask to anoint them with oil. It's talking about the person having faith, not Paul. So don't ever let someone use this to take this out of context 
and say this is a proof that we have faith healers. I believe in faith healing right here, not faith healers. You want to send money in to get a handkerchief that somebody's prayed over and things like that? I've got a decorative one right here that we can send the same amount of money and it'll do the same thing. Because it's not about that. Okay, It's not about the oil either. It's about the faith. And so he leapt and walked. Now when this happened, the people started worshiping Barnabas and Paul and calling Barnabas Jupiter and calling Paul Mercurius because, or Mercury, because he was the one speaking. So they started worshiping them. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul who was raised his whole life to disdain idolatry. Now he's being worshipped as a false god. Did y'all get that? I need to go back. He's worshipped as a false god. And there you have in your notes, it's already printed, uh, Acts 14, 11 through 12. And when the people who had seen Paul, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lysonia, the gods are come down to us in likeness of men, and they are called, Barn uh, called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief uh, speaker. Because Mercury in the, the Greek and the Roman mythology, Mercury was the messenger carrier for Zeus Jupiter. Uh, and so that's the reason why we were saying that. So they were saying Jupiter, calling Barnabas Jupiter, he was the chief god, and Paul was his, his uh, uh, messenger. And there came certain of them, that, and uh, uh, hither from the Jews, icon, uh, oops, let's see, uh, let me go back. Um, all right, and, and when that happened, Paul runs in the middle of them. The Bible says he runs right in the middle of them and says, stop, stop, stop. They, while they had already gone and gotten a, a cow to come sacrifice to Jupiter and Mercurius, Barnabas and Saul, and Paul. And they said, no, no, we're just like you. We're just like you. And then when that happens, the Jews come and say, these people are causing problems, and they actually drag them out of town, and they stone the Apostle Paul. Now, I don't know what you've known, heard about uh, stoning people, but it's not like you're taking little pebbles and throwing a lot at them. Stoning in the Old Testament and New Testament times was they grabbed the largest rocks they could possibly lift and throw them on the person as they were on the ground. That's what stoning was. Not just having a rock and throwing it at somebody. I mean, that, that ain't no big deal compared. But they would take those rocks, huge rocks, as large as they could, and throw them on the body. That's what stoning was. And they left Paul for dead, the Bible says. And there came thither Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. And then the, the Bible says, we'll, we'll stop right here. The Bible says that they were all standing around looking at his dead body, basically. And then he stands up and walks off. Isn't that amazing? And so they, they perceived that a miracle took place. And so he leaves and goes uh, down to Derby, and that's where we'll pick up. Uh, if I make it back, we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. But we'll talk about uh, uh, Derby and uh, finish up with the uh, uh, first missionary journey. All right, Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your love, and I pray now that you dismiss us and help us during the preaching. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.